This week we'll be talking about the origin and dispersal of modern humans, and specifically we're going to address the, uh, the hypotheses that are at the forefront of explaining kind of how and when and why modern humans became the dominant and then thusly the only uh, hominin on the planet. So our objectives are to compare and contrast the two major models that seek to explain modern human origins, giving supportive evidence for each model, and explaining why recent molecular evidence has largely resolved this issue, to describe the major geographical areas and the general dating of key early fossil evidence of modern humans, to describe the physical features of Homo floresiensis, who's one of these kind of outgroups. Um, we'll also talk about then Homo naledi as another, uh, and to explain why the discovery of these two hominins was such a surprise, and then to discuss the cultural developments that characterize the Upper Paleolithic as well as contemporaneous cultures in other parts of the world, so Africa, Europe, uh, etc., and then how uh, these compare and contrast to the technological practices of earlier periods. So some of the basic questions that we have regarding the appearance of modern humans, and modern humans are also designated Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, they are also sometimes abbreviated in the literature AMH, which stands for anatomically modern human. Uh, we want to ask when they first appeared in the fossil record, where this transition took place. Was it just in one area of the world or was it in several? Um, what was the pace of their evolutionary change? How quickly did this transition from multiple species of hominins to only AMHs occur? And then how did the dispersal of modern humans to other areas of the old world outside of their area of origin take place? As we approach this discussion of the appearance and, and uh, kind of uh, rapid growth of modern human origins, we've got two predominant uh, contrasting views. We've got one that's called the regional continuity model, also called multi-regionalism, uh, and then we've got a combination of various replacement models. Um, as we talk about the two of these, we recognize that the origins of the earliest members of anatomically modern humans, uh, the go back to somewhere close to about 200,000 years ago. Um, some estimates may put kind of the first AMH at, a, at more like 250 or 300,000 years ago. Some put modern humans much more recently. We also know that by about 50,000 years ago, so in the span of only 150,000 years, anatomically modern humans had spread across much of the or most of the old world, uh, including Europe, Asia, uh, and on into Australia. We also recognize that regardless of which of these views you take, which of these approaches you take to understanding modern human origins, that the likely descendant or the likely ancestor uh, of Homo sapiens sapiens was um, someone within this designation of Homo heidelbergensis that we talked about last week. The regional continuity model is also uh, termed multi-regional evolution. This suggests that Local populations of pre-modern humans, so this would include Neanderthals and Denisovans, this would include populations of Homo heidelbergensis uh, that were already in place in Europe, Asia, and Africa, continued their indigenous evolutionary development from these pre-modern Middle Pleistocene forms to anatomically modern humans. Now, one of the biggest issues that arises with applying a multi-regional model is then how on earth would we get so many different local populations around the globe evolving into only one species that has incredibly similar morphology. I mean, when we talk about the biological species um, idea or the biological species, uh, I am totally spacing on the word, um, concept, um, you know, we recognize that Generally, geographic isolation leads to more rapid speciation because you've got really regional or even local microclimates that are independently asserting different adaptive pressures onto the populations that are present in those areas. Um, Multi-regionalism has tried to counter this question by denying that the earliest modern Homo sapiens originated exclusively in Africa and also asserting that there could be significant levels of gene flow or migration between various geographically dispersed pre-modern populations that were extremely likely throughout the Pleistocene. Um, so 
gene flow. <laughs> the long and short of it, the answer there in a nutshell is gene flow. That by having high rates of gene flow, um, we end up with populations that really aren't all that different, um, that share a lot of, of commonalities. And we certainly note that modern humans, once they emerge, uh, are very quickly to uh, disperse and engage in gene flow. I mean, we'll talk about, as we move on with this lecture, this degree of interbreeding with like Neanderthals and Denisovans. We also mentioned it last week, right, that, uh, that we were even willing to interbreed with uh, regional populations of pre-modern humans, certainly willing to breed with other populations of fully modern humans. Um, one of <coughs> the areas, uh, the geographical areas where um, the researchers present there uh, kind of cling really strongly to this multi-regional idea of modern human evolution um, is in China. And so as we talk about the first moderns or the earliest moderns that we see in China, we'll talk specifically about um, those questionable fossils from the Shikudian cave that we talked about last week. We'll talk about um, some very early uh, crania that show some interesting mixes of primitive and modern traits. And so um, it is from researchers in China who are working in areas like Shikudian that uh, that we find more, much uh, greater support for this um, regional continuity model, or at least some role of East Asia in this emergence of anatomically modern humans. So gene flow would have thusly presented, prevented speciation between these regional lineages. All hominins following Homo erectus, according to this uh, school of thought, are designated or classified as Homo sapiens. So that means that all regional populations of Homo heidelbergensis are Homo sapiens, uh, that Homo, potentially Homo antecessor from the Atapuerca Mountains, that Neanderthals and Denisovans are all considered members of the species Homo sapiens. And this goes along with this idea of, you know, we've had this continuing discussion of what we call lumpers versus splitters, right? And we've talked about this with respect to Erectus versus Ergaster. We've talked about this with respect to, to how we name Neanderthals and Denisovans. And so according to this regional continuity model, if they are all in fact Homo sapiens, then <clears throat> populations like Neanderthals and Denisovans simply represent uh, subspecies level differences. So we would have Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens, uh, I don't know, they haven't given a uh, subspecies name to Denisovans, maybe it'd be Denisovanensis, I don't know, that's kind of hard to say. Um, but the point being that they represent different subspecies, not different species. By contrast, replacement models emphasize that modern humans first evolved in Africa and only later dispersed to other parts of the world where they replaced those hominins that were already living in other regions. We have two versions of uh, conventional replacement models. One of those is called complete replacement. This proposes that anatomically modern human populations arose in Africa within the last 200,000 years and then migrated from Africa and completely replaced pre-modern populations that were present in Europe and Asia. This doesn't allow for or account for a transition from pre-modern humans to anatomically modern humans anywhere in the world except for Africa. Um, so this negates the possibility that uh, we would have any uh, instances of interbreeding. This would thusly designate all pre-modern populations outside of Africa taxonomically differently as different species. So Neanderthal populations would be Homo neanderthalensis, Denisovan populations would be uh, Homo denisovanensis. Um, and when we look at modern genetic data, the uh, genetic patterns that we observe today between geographically widespread humans are then thought to at least partly reflect migrations that occurred in the late Pleistocene. We do, for example, see far more genetic diversity in Africa than anywhere else in the world. This is evidence in both um, uh, in both nuclear DNA and in mitochondrial DNA. Um, for example, there are seven mitochondrial DNA lineages within Africa, only four mitochondrial DNA lineages outside of Africa. Uh, we've also seen this with respect to uh, Y chromosomes that, and I don't remember the exact number here, pardon me for spacing on it, I think it's something like uh, four distinct Y chromosome lineages that are present in Africa. One of those is only present in Africa and there are fewer lineages of Y chromosomes outside of Africa. Uh, so we find 
um, the genetic diversity in other populations and other species is generally higher uh, in the areas where those species evolved and lower as we get migrations out from those areas due to things like founders effects. Um, but what this model doesn't allow for is uh, any kind of level or evidence of interbreeding between Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, in contrast, or in direct opposition to this model, and we've already talked about it last week, we've got a pretty high uh, prevalence um, of, or pretty high uh, support, pretty large support for uh, at least two waves of interbreeding um, for uh, modern humans with Neanderthals, and at least one wave of interbreeding of modern humans with Denisovans, as well as this uh, Denisovan-Neanderthal hybrid that's recently been discovered. So um, the level of interbreeding that we see between pre-modern populations and anatomically modern humans uh, stands in stark contrast to what's proposed by the complete replacement uh, model. So the uh, way to accommodate for or account for that degree of interbreeding is through the partial replacement model, which allows for periods of interbreeding after anatomically modern humans left Africa. This would allow for interbreeding both of anatomically modern humans with Neanderthals and with Denisovans. Um, in support of this, when we look at the presence or absence of Neanderthal genes in the genomes of modern humans, we find that for populations within Africa, there are no Neanderthal genes present. For populations outside of Africa, there are varying percentages of Neanderthal genes present. Um, for most of the world, um, this is somewhere around 2.3%, though there are certainly some populations with significantly higher um, proportion of Neanderthal genes, uh, including Native Americans who uh, have about 4% of their genome, um, including Neanderthal genes. These, this period of interbreeding was most likely between about 80 and 50,000 years ago, probably in the Middle East. There was some work done in 2010 by Jeff Long over at UNM looking specifically at microsatellite DNA. So these are components that are clumped in with nuclear DNA, but they're not really uh, directly coding. Um, they more help to uh, regulate this process of uh, cell division and specifically uh, mitosis. And uh, Jeff Long's research with the microsatellite DNA points to a wave of interbreeding around 60,000 years ago in the Middle East and around 45,000 years ago um, in Asia. We also find Denisovan DNA in, found in modern Southeast Asian, Pacific Islander, and Australian populations. So particularly those residents of what we call Sahul, this would include um, the islands of New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand area. Uh, and so what we also find when looking at kind of the continuity of the uh, genetic diversity that we see across the Sahul in particular uh, and in Asia as a whole, we've got evidence for a two-stage process of migration of modern humans into Asia. The first modern humans entered Asia sometime around 75 to 62,000 years ago. These go on to become the Australian Aboriginal populations that have some pretty different morphological features, particularly related to like their sloping foreheads and such, um, but even more notably some very uh, specific genetic markers. And then a second wave around 38 to 25,000 years ago uh, that moved anatomically modern humans into East Asia, so China, and etc. Um, the assimilation model then hypothesizes that more interbreeding took place at least in some regions. And so uh, when we look at uh, kind of partial competition or partial replacement coupled with assimilation. Um, the assimilation model is saying that our modern human genome simply kind of subsumed uh, the genomes of pre-modern populations into our own kind of species and subspecies designation. So through greater levels of interbreeding, um, we end up just simply um, kind of absorbing those populations of pre-moderns and this represent or this rec uh, recognizes that this could vary based on where you are. So there could have been more quote-unquote assimilation in areas where Neanderthals and Denisovans persisted far longer, for example, like uh, in Eastern Asia. <clears throat> 
So we'll now look at some of the evidence for the earliest uh, record of modern humans across the world. We'll start in Africa. The earliest fossils of anatomically modern humans in Africa date to around 200 to 100,000 years ago. Uh, there's a site in Ethiopia called Omokabish, that's the skull that you see here, here pictured, uh, that dates to 195,000 years ago. It is certainly, uh, I mean, it's essentially modern. Um, there are some features that we only find in modern humans, including the chin. The general view is that we uh, treated the chin as something that was sexually selected for. Uh, so it was mediated through female assessment of male attractiveness. And so the chin then is not really a functional trait in the sense of it doesn't confer a survival benefit, but now all modern humans have chins because <laughs> the initial uh, modern human females found chins sexy when they first appeared. Uh, there are other <coughs> cranial characteristics um, that are fairly modern. We see a reduced brow ridge, for example. And then uh, for one of the particular representatives from Omokabish, um, some less modern um, cranial characteristics. So we see a, a pretty big diversity in brain size among the crania that we find in Omokabish. Uh, the Kleistis River mouth and border cave on the south coast of Africa, so in, in the country of South Africa, we've got specimens that date to about 120 to 80,000 years ago. And then Herto from the middle Awash in Ethiopia dates to between 160 and 154,000 years ago. The interesting thing about the Herto skulls is that we've got a mostly complete adult cranium. We also have an incomplete adult cranium and uh, very significantly we have a fairly complete child's cranium. Um, so this allows us to look at things like pace of development. Remember we talked a little bit about this uh, period of juvenile dependency that comes with our larger brain size and we talked about how uh, childhood likely emerged uh, firstly with Homo erectus. Uh, we don't see something akin to adolescence appear until uh, we are well into the tenure of anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Um, so one uh, quote from your text regarding uh, the hair toe skulls in particular is that this is um, a sample of a population that is on the verge of anatomical modernity but not yet fully modern. File this away in the back of your mind because we're going to talk at the very end of this lecture about a new kind of third interpretation maybe or third kind of viewpoint of the origin and dispersal of modern humans that we're going to call African multi-regionalism. Uh, and we're going to come back and specifically address some of this diversity that we see in the early modern populations in Africa. In the Near East, so we're talking about <clears throat> the Middle East, Israel, etc. The earliest fossils date to about 130,000 to 100,000 years ago. There are two caves in particular, the Skuhul Cave and Kavza uh, Caves in Israel. Uh, the Skuhul Cave dates to 130,000 years ago. The Kavza Cave dates to about 120,000 years ago. Uh, what we find in the Middle East is considerable chronological overlap between Neanderthals that were present um, and the modern humans that were present. So we've got an, a period of overlap of roughly 30 to 60,000 years during which periods of interbreeding are not only possible but fairly likely. In Asia we've got the earliest fossils that are fully modern not appearing until about 40,000 years ago and so we've got the Tianwan cave uh, at Jukurian that dates to about 40,000 years ago. The uh, remains from this cave have mostly modern features with just a few archaic characteristics. What they suggest for is evidence for African origins, but perhaps Asian interbreeding. So the retention of those ancestral or primitive characteristics may be indicative of uh, interbreeding with the pre-modern populations that were already present in Asia. Um, we know that these pre-modern populations existed for a substantial period of time in relative isolation before anatomically modern and humans arrive, arose, arose on the scene. We've got the Ordos cave in Mongolia. Um, we've got what we mentioned in our previous lecture, the Janishwan skeleton that has some modern features present in it as far back as maybe 200,000 years ago. It is this skeleton that is the 
kind of precipitator of uh, this viewpoint that maybe in East Asia, at least, we've got some element of the regional continuity model or uh, the multi-regional theory. Um, the Nias skull in Borneo in Indonesia has modern features, dates to about 45 to 40,000 years ago. The Utishim uh, cave in Western Siberia uh, only has the remains of a femur. This femur dates back to about 45,000 years ago. When we look at the nuclear genome obtained from this femur, we've got genetic admixture with Neanderthals at about 2.3%. Uh, Interestingly, though, the Utishim um, specimen doesn't have any genetic ties to any modern lineages that are still alive. So some of these populations of anatomically modern humans that perhaps did interbreed um, more so with these pre-moderns around the world um, ended up being evolutionary dead ends. They weren't, not that the species was, of course the species wasn't, we are anatomically modern humans, but at least that some of these isolated populations don't leave a significant uh, mark on our, um, on, in modern populations. In Australia, we've got settlement by about 50,000 years ago, with anatomically modern humans moving into Sahul. This includes New Guinea and Australia. They likely used bamboo rafts to cross the ocean. Um, <clears throat> there are permanent water crossings, so this is gonna, not going to happen without significant risk, uh, which is likely one reason why the populations that initially settled Australia remained incredibly isolated until well into modern times with uh, Europeans setting up Australia as a penal colony. Um, we don't have any pre-modern humans evidenced in Australia only uh, what we consider anatomically modern humans. There's one site called Lake Mungo in southeastern Australia that has both archaeological and human remains. These both, using independent methods of dating, date to between 30 and 25,000 years ago. We also have the cow swamp that dates very recently to about 14 to 9,000 years ago. The cow swamp uh, specimen, which is the one here on the bottom, retains certain archaic uh, cranial traits, including the sloping or receding forehead head, a very heavy supraorbital torus, um, and thick bones. So um, it is entirely possible, as we were talking about the movement of AMHs into Asia, that Australian Aboriginal populations represent this first movement into the Sahul before about se or around about 75,000 years ago. But then more recent populations of anatomically modern humans who have lost some of these uh, traits that are retained by the Aboriginal populations then resettle uh, areas of East Asia closer to about 30,000 years ago. So when we look at the genetic evidence, all native Australians are descendant of a single migration that dates back at least 50,000 years ago. The whole genome analysis comparing modern Aboriginal Australians to modern indigenous populations nearby uh, points to a date of divergence somewhere between about 75,000 and 60,000. 62,000 years ago.